the changes that we're discussing today and what we're focused on now is relate to project jump cannon so it's a future protocol upgrade um these changes would be included in and project jump cannon uh is aims to bring smart contracts to Stellar. Uh, we've actually modularized a lot of these changes. And so there's a whole slew of caps that are related to Jump Cannon, caps 46 through 53. Since this is a pretty technical discussion, if you want to follow along, I urge you to take a look at those caps. If you're interested in joining the discussion, I urge you to join the Stellar Dev mailing list. And if you want to also follow along with Jump Cannon development more generally, um, you can do so here in the Jump Cannon uh, uh, channel and also in the Jump Cannon Dev channel, um, and so today again we're focused on on Jump Cannon related caps. There's a pretty uh, there's there's a lot on the agenda, a lot of small stuff, but there may also be some bigger issues that we're talking about. Um, if as you're listening, if you have questions, um, the best thing to do is to put them in live chat uh, in text. I'll do my best to monitor it. I mean, the goal here is to actually have substantive discussion that moves forward some of these changes and that answers questions and allows continued development. So um, we may or may not have time to address the, the issues in live chat, but if we don't do it now during this meeting, we'll definitely take a look at that channel afterwards too. So feel free to put your questions or, or thoughts there. And that's the end of the intro. Um, everybody here, it looks like, looks like we got a full house. Um, Okay, cool. So I guess to start off with, we, we have an agenda that has um, like, and I guess we can just like sort of start with what's at the top of the agenda. I also know that there's some questions about uh, interoperability that we may want to address. I, I think maybe we start with 46 removal of box agenda yeah. item. I, I put a bunch of agenda, I, I put a bunch of agenda items on here. You can hear me. Everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. At least I can hear you. Cool. Yes. OK. Um, yeah, I put a bunch of agenda items on here, um, but they're all really straightforward. So I can just cruise through them really quickly. Um, uh, box is in uh, Cap46. It's, it's an object that contains a value. I think this is actually just an artifact of the notion that we might have had mutable objects, because uh, I think, as far as I can tell, it's, it's basically indistinguishable so long as we have immutable objects and we haven't reified pointers. There's, no way to differentiate an object that contains a value from just a value. Uh, so Lee suggested that we get rid of this, and I'm happy to get rid of it until we discover some reason to bring it back in the future. Go on once, go on twice. I guess I have a, maybe a question. Yeah. <laughs> so is that, does, it, does that mean if, if later we, we decide to have mutable host objects, they would yeah, just have to be boxed like that? That's right. That's right. That's we, would it? Just, we would just bring back. So it's actually completely back. I mean, forward compatible. Back as far, yeah, we just bring we would just bring the, the object type back in the future. It's just that since we don't have any reason for it right now, then why not delete it? Yeah, makes sense. Okay. So um, yeah, I just as a part of deleting this, I want to get rid of the cycle. This gets rid of our only cyclic reference in the structure. Okay. So I want to get I want to get rid of the option on the box. So we definitely can bring this back later on. But if we do bring this later on. We should put a little bit of effort into making sure that the XDRPP, the C++ XDR lib, can do non-option cycling references, which um, there is already a plan for. But yeah, just calling that out. Yeah, it's implemented in C++ 20. So either we can move Stellar Core to C++ 20 or we can backport it to C++ 17. Yeah, that's a, it's a somewhat bigger kettle of fish. but. Um... I mean, we have a workaround anyway. If we really, really need it, we really need to bring it back. We could move to an optional box like this, but this there is this is motivated by getting rid of it. So that'll actually make a lot of the on the wire stuff uh, four bytes smaller. Okay, second issue, which is very, very minor. Um, we went with positive I sixty four as the we we renamed U sixty three like two weeks ago into positive I sixty four to be a little bit clearer because sixty three is a weird number and everyone. Who sees it is like, what is what is that? Why should there be a 63-bit number? And it's actually just like a 64-bit number that happens to be positive. And John pointed out that you know zero is in there. And depending on which mathematical tradition you come from, zero is either both positive and negative or neither positive and negative. Uh, and some people believe non-negative is the correct word to use when you're including zero in the set of numbers that include zero and all the positive numbers. I don't personally care. I'm perfectly happy to have the word pause in there. I think it's reasonably easy for people to understand. I could also put in non-neg or NN or something like that, but I figure terminology-wise, I've got you all here. 
we're going to we're basically going to merge this right now. So please commit to a terminology. Does anyone have a, a preference? I think non-neg is fine if that's more accurate, but I, I don't really care. I, personally, I think U63 was fine, but yeah, non-neg is fine too. I, I, I did too. I don't care. I like U63 personally. It's short and it says what it means. Um, Literally everyone who sees it has like this weird sour note in their mind and is like, why is that 63? What is wrong with you? 63 is not a computer number. 64 is a computer number. But that is, that is, actually, the correct, that is actually the correct reaction because it is a weird type. So like except that, the, except that it, like, it projects it projects to and from i sixty four, so so the, the 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 type that you can convert to and from is i sixty four actually. Why i sixty four not u sixty four? That's uh, a symptom of the language we're using too. Like you know, if we were writing contracts in Zig, u sixty three would actually make sense. That should be a thing. I mean, the the thing is, like, I don't think the weird reaction is to the name. I think the weird reaction is to the concept. But then in context, it, it makes sense. So why not just? pick the more accurate name but this seems like a megabyte shed thing it is a megabyte shed um i'll go back to u63 if everyone wants u63 but i will not entertain another comment on this after this meeting so this is it yes thank you uh i mean it it's like boolean right that? like boolean is not one bit in most uh, like if you have a variable like that right so it is the same thing so i'm i'm fine with i'm actually i prefer u63 as well because it actually tells you what it is Everyone wants U63. Okay, we're going back to U63. Um, next issue was CAP47 and CAP53. We noticed partway through last week that um, assuming that we want some kind of mutability of contracts, which apparently we kind of do, or even if we don't want mutability of contracts, we still want a way to load contracts uh, from the middle of execution because we want to be able to call them. Um, and so at a representation level, uh, the XDR that represents ledger entries uh, with separate ledger entries for code and data seemed possibly to be overkill. And so we talked about it and came to the conclusion that it would probably be tidier. We actually had, like like in, in the implementation, we had um, pages and pages of, of SQL code for both of these types, and they're pretty much identical. Uh, Siddharth and I worked through this stuff, and, and they really only differ on a, you know one field, which is whether there's an additional subkey. Uh, so we thought that it might be nice to just merge those two, and there's a single type of contract-related entry that still has a contract ID, they all have a contract ID, uh, and has a subkey, and the subkey has a, one magic value carved out. We have lots of places to carve out magic values, and we can just carve them out of the uh, SC static uh, value set, and we just have a, a designated key, and all it means is the current contracts, or, or the, 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 the owning contracts own WASM code. And then we just store a binary in it, an SE binary type. Um, and so we implemented that. It seems to work fine. Um, I have not updated the cap yet. I wanted to run that by everyone, make sure everyone's okay with it. It it leans us a little bit towards mutable contracts, but I believe a lot of our design discussion has been drifting in that direction anyway. It does not wet us to that. We do not have to. We could also special case it and just prohibit rights to that key. Um, but it, it sort of has that tendency of treating code and data as the same thing which at some level they are. So I, I spoke to Siddharth about this yesterday quite a bit in the afternoon. But one of, the, one of my main concerns around mutable code, and this is much more about the mutable code aspect of it than about the merging them. The merging it, I care less about other than the fact that it like makes them like default mutable and we now need to opt back out of that, which I'm about to explain. Like You can't just say the code is mutable without having some rules around what that means. And we have not successfully agreed on what those rules are. What happens if you mutate a code, mutate a contract that's currently running? What happens if you delete a contract that's currently running? What happens if you delete a contract that is running, then call another contract that calls back into the first contract? Which contract runs the second time? Like these things need to be well defined. So we should like start from the fact that we can store code as data, but you can't mutate it, and then figure out how to mutate it. Um, but like we don't have answers to those questions yet, or at least I haven't heard answers to those kinds of questions yet. No, I agree. We don't. We we did, however, uh, have in Cap forty seven a function for writing uh, a contract code entry. So whatever that host function semantics are, they're the same semantics here. 
Well, the, the thing is that, uh, yeah, it, it's like what John is saying, like currently, right? Like when you write a ledger entry, the, this is observable by anything after, like immediately after. Whereas here, I think we, we have to decide and we probably cannot make this actually, uh, this cannot be true, I think, because um, this is going to be probably scoped with the, uh, or tied up to the lifetime of the, uh, of the WASM runtime that's actually executing the code. So if you have like, if you call yourself type of thing, uh, actually, we're certainly not going to, we're, we're not going to hot patch the, the, the running one. Uh, exactly. Could, yeah. So th this is, but this is like a, a place where this is actually deviating from what we do for data. So we have to really, yeah, specify this and think about it very hard. That, that's exactly what I was saying. Nico. You just said, it yeah, yeah. Than no, no, I know. Like it's, it's kind of scary in a way that the, <laughs> I don't know what the right answer is on actually. I, I, no, I, see, I don't. I don't actually think this is this is particularly scary. I think there are really only two possible options, and they're both fine. Um, and you know, uh, one of them is you do what Unix does, which is that you um, the executing process is essentially uh, uh, disjoint as soon as it starts executing. And so, if you rewrite the file, that's fine. The next exec to that to that will get the new code. But like, so did we de did we actually decide on reentrancy, for example, like what you can or cannot do? Well, actually, you get e busy in Unix. Uh, no, you can write a file while it's running. Uh, you get you get busy on uh, Windows. The file is locked on Windows while it's executing on Unix. You can rewrite the file. As far as I know, because I do upgrades of running programs all the time, and it works. Like if I if I upgrade Chrome while it's running, if I if I do apt-get install bash, it works. And my bash. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I literally just tested this, um, and I get eBusy. Um, I mean, I, this is kind of a side note, but I think what you're doing when you upgrade is you're unlinking the file and creating a new file, but you can't you can't like write to an inode that's currently executing. Okay, sure. Unlink and relink. That's fine. Well, unlink and create a different inode. Yeah. My my point is. It's it's, it's totally doable in some contexts and in other contexts you block it. And those are the only two options here. So, and That's I think true. they're both fine. There are other options. Okay, the, there's the only two reasonable options. The other one is what hot patch your existing running program, which you're not going to do. No, there's at least one other option, which is like, you can't update something while it's running. You have to delegate. That's, the block. That's what I just said. That's the other option. Block or allow. What, what, what exactly do you mean by block? I guess it fails. You try to make the right and the right fails. It's just a special case. We just special what, case what writes, writes, writes to the running the writes to the running code fail because we decided to. But then, how you do you do? actually do the update? I guess like you're just saying you can't mutate it. You can't mutate time. your own. You can you can mutate someone else's. Okay, but like that needs a lot of specification in and of itself. And I was providing an example of how you could do that. You can't just like I can't just modify your contract, right? Like there's obvious that's obviously not acceptable. Um. So, but we have a we have a we have like managed contract transactions, right? That that that's that's the out of band technique. But like that doesn't work. Like it works in a very like very tight sense. But like, what if you're a DAO that's managing a smart contract? You'd like to be able to manage it from smart, right? Okay, then we so allow. There's like there's like a whole bunch of space here that I'm like, it's like sure maybe you have two high level options allow or block, but like block has many sub options. Okay. I, I I I don't I don't see this as I don't see this as relating to the question, which is, do we store this as a ledger entry or not? I agree that individual host functions need to have semantics defined for them. But okay, um, I guess what I'm getting at is, I would accept this change if we make it so that you can't mutate the code while it's running right now, um, and we can figure it out later. Okay, um, but if you're going to allow it right now, then we need to do a lot more work, and it's not a good idea. Sorry, if we if we allow rights to the currently running contract right we need to do more work okay um, so, we'll, so basically we'll, what i'm getting we'll at is that it just are currently immutable even no, if it's stored as data no the currently running contract is immutable but we as i just said we have no mechanism to write to a not running contract or not a good mechanism we should just make it immutable if it's okay sure like what i'm saying is let's separate the mutability problem from the representation problem okay then we can make progress because like I, I don't want to approve this if we don't have like I don't want to approve it in the mutable case if we don't have a good story about mutability. 
and we don't write math. Gotcha. Okay. So only only reading, only the read path works for this key right now, and the write path just fails. Um, I have a question about not about the mutability, but the representation. Um, if we're making it a ledger key that you have to write, and in the future we do decide to support mutability, uh, will it mean that the only way to update the contract is to write the entire binary every time? Um, or uh, so, like, I'm just wondering about if somebody, if we support mutability, and somebody wants to write a contract where they swap back and forth between multiple implementations like rolling back or something like that um and just the cost of writing an entire contract which might be a couple of kilobytes um versus store if this is just data storing this data um under you know just like regular data and then having a pointer to that data Does that make any sense? Yeah, it, it gets into what we, we talked about a little bit uh, in a, yet another one of the threads this week, which is like, is there any kind of delegation mechanism? Um, I, I, I think it's a little bit awkward because, um, well, first of all, we actually have to come up with a delegation mechanism that, that we can all agree on, which uh, is going to be weeks of conversation. Um, but also, you, you wind up needing to pre flight every single transaction in that case, because uh, you need to resolve the, the current delegate. But, well, I, I, you, maybe you don't need to pre-flight them if you can guess where the delegate is currently pointing. But anyway, I, 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 I feel like. It sounds like it increases the complexity of this. And that, that's like, I, I'm not interested in increasing the complexity. I'm just curious if we're just yeah, pinning, I mean, pinning any sort of future, limiting something we can do in the future. I don't. I don't think so because again, I think I think um, Cap forty seven already has a function called write contract, and it takes a binary. Like that's 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 the point here is to just absorb the two representation questions, not not necessarily to solve do we have proxying or delegation or whatever, which we might have. But uh, you know, uh, when we had that conversation this week, um, John was really uh, adamant about like let's let's ship without and see what happens and. I can I can live with that because we it's true like we could we could make the wrong delegation mechanism and then we'd be stuck supporting it forever. So makes sense. Okay, the rep, like like zoomed in, focused on the representation question. Nobody has any real objections. I think it's really non contentious. Okay, so the final thing I had on the agenda, which is uh, uh, the footprint type, which is like even less contentious. Uh, I'll just be extending Cap53 with a new data type, which is called footprint, and it just contains two lists of ledger keys. Uh, the only really possibly contentious aspect of this, I think, is whether ledger keys, full keys, should be there or whether they should be restricted to only contract data uh, values or, or, or value contract ID pairs or something like that. It's something that is a little bit tighter than a ledger key. Um, but if we do that, it means that we are essentially fixing the impossibility of interacting with other ledger entries into the protocol uh, going forward. And I think the interoperability question uh, still leaves that open. So I was assuming that it would be a full ledger key. Uh, at least I, in conversation with John, he, he again, uh, fairly clearly suggested that he would prefer to keep that, that door open and I'm happy to go with that. So does anyone feel strongly? Uh, what do you mean by footprint here? You just mean the uh, like, Sorry, like the, footprint, the, the footprint is a term that was introduced in CAP. Uh, D3. Oh, the other one, the data. Uh, yeah, it's what we have been calling up up until recently the read-write set. Um, I found that actually the paper that introduces this concept of deterministic execution uses the word footprint, and I think footprint is actually a great word to use here, so I've decided to start using it as well. Because otherwise you wind up with the read-only part of the read-write set and the read-write part of the read-write set, and honestly, linguistically, it's a little bit clumsy. Nobody cares about the footprint. Okay, cool. I'll just make it a ledger key set. That is the end of my agenda items. I yield the floor to discussion of interoperability or whatever else you want to talk about. 
Thank you. Uh, John, is this a discussion that, that you want to kick off? Do you have questions? Um, are we switching now on to like acid and drop stuff? Is that, that where we are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that all we've sort of gone through all of the existing stuff on the agenda. And the only thing that, that was a big question mark was the asset interoperability stuff. And I think that that's where we are at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think the only real thing to talk about here, which like, we have not been able to come to agreement on. It's just like, what are even the requirements? What are we trying to achieve? Uh, me, Nico, Tomer, Lee talk about this prop, like this problem, I don't know, like three times a week right now. And I don't even think we're all talking about the same thing. So I think we just need to talk about our feelings. So anybody can take the floor from that. Yeah, I, I love talking about my feelings, so I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the basic requirement from asset interop, in my opinion, is... So let's... Um, yeah, uh, maybe it's worth thinking about, like, the full spectrum of, of interop or, or about the edges um, and where we are in the middle. So, you know, I think, like, on one extreme interop uh, thing, we just do nothing. Right, uh, and this is uh, you can look, for example, at like Aurora on on Near, which is you know a whole blockchain running inside of the blockchain that has like no interop whatsoever. And if you want to interop with the parent chain, you need to go through uh, you know various bridging solutions. So I think that's a very extreme version, which is no interop at all, um, and it basically means that we're not taking advantage of the existing Stellar ecosystem at all. But it's extremely simple. We just don't need to think about legacy um, interop at all. Um, I think on the other extreme side of interop, you have full interop with every primitive uh, on the current Stellar network. So you can do things like interop between smart contracts and AMMs and the order book and uh, uh, sponsorships and, and like the wide uh, everything that Stellar proposes. Um, and that uh, you know, it's great for like supporting legacy, but it's also terrible because it means that we're bringing a lot of the, um, you know, technical debt uh, and the idiosyncrasies in, in the classic protocol to, to the new world. So I think we need to find somewhere in between. Um, and I would say that even though there are a lot of disagreements in this in this room, I think the basic thing that we agree on is that assets are the main point of interoperability. Like we're not trying to bring the order books. We're not trying to bring AMMs. Uh, we just want to make sure that classic assets still operate in um, in Smartland, and um, you know, basically, like asset issuers still have their uh, infrastructure intact, and and they don't need to make changes. And so we have you know service providers like you know Fireblocks and Bitco and all these folks. You know, their services are still um, you know viable and working even uh, in this world without. Uh, without a change. Does that make sense to people? Oh, maybe uh, I'll, I'll pick it up. Uh, yeah, like with the without a change, it's kind of uh, like a, that's the, the part that, right, that is kind of uh, preloaded, I would say. Um, like the, uh, like, as soon as you, as we say, there is basically like um, there are two parts to it, right? There is the um, do I expect on day one, as soon as we have like uh, smart contract smart contract capabilities, can I use any classic asset on the network kind of automatically, right, uh, or not, uh, like using uh, smart? And that to me is like one version of that extreme inside this box that you described where you know no change needed um and um i'm i'm I, i'm we've been kind of trying to and, and john probably can expand on that but like it it seems to me that if we try to make it that extreme um we we are kind of uh really con over constraining what type of things you can do in smart uh, in terms of uh, the as those assets, right? Because um, 
you, you expect those assets to be represented by uh, trust lines and, and you have like all those things, right, that comes with that. And you have like the semantics that are really um, specific, right, to classic. Um, so that, there is that, like that version. I think there is a, a, maybe a more nuanced you know, version of this that is, uh, yeah, like what... Um, like what? What do you mean when you say like no change? Does it mean um, that uh, yeah, you don't, you want to have people that issued tokens on Stellar? They want to make sure that uh, they continue. They, we don't break their compliance story or whatever they they have right in terms of like uh, what they are what they sign up for basically with the network, right? Like we're expanding the the set of capabilities um, and. Uh, and this one is it sounds more to me like uh like a, there is like some room there where you can say well maybe um maybe people need to like uh, issuers in this context of classic assets need to uh have like a kind of uh, opt into uh smart capabilities and maybe they have like a way to specify which subset of the capabilities they are interested in and when you do that <clears throat> then you have like maybe a, a different um, way to represent those assets. Uh, kind of like when we introduce claimable balances, uh, like claimable balances are actually a, a, a good example of where we kind of introduce this this way to kind of go uh, in, in a way like uh, that was actually breaking a little bit in terms of uh, compliance, but at the same time, uh, we try to be um, for tokens that don't have a lot of restrictions, claimable balances are kind of uh, can flow uh, freely, right? And to me, like the, trying to do a similar thing with smart is probably um, like a would be probably a good uh, middle ground. Um, but for that, it's an opt-in, so that means you don't get automatically like everybody, you know, every cl classic asset kind of shows up on day one. Yeah, so I think claimable balances are a really good uh, example. Um, you know, they're a fairly novel concept. And for the most part, aside from, um, you know, a small set of like super specific Stellar wallets, uh, it, we, we haven't even seen um, support for them in ma with major service providers. Um, so it's worth, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking about minimal change, uh, I think it's worth dividing this into the different stakeholders that we're talking about. So um, I think on one end, you have the more kind of like institutional cross-chain services, things like exchanges, things like, um, you know, things like uh, Fireblocks and BitGo, things like, um, um, you know, even like Circle as an issuer. Like these folks, um, you know, take the path of least resistance. It's been even difficult to get Muxed accounts implemented with these folks. So I would say that from their perspective, we uh, like zero change is preferable. Now, for the actual touch points uh, for the smart contracts, obviously uh, it's okay to introduce change, right? Like if a wallet wants to interact with uh, with uh, some crypto primitive, uh, some smart contract, and then obviously they need to introduce change. It's and it's okay, you know. So uh, you know, on the wallet side itself, and from a user perspective that's trying to use the smart side. It's definitely okay to introduce uh, some uh, some changes. Um, and I, yeah. can I have a, actually have a question on exchanges? Like when you say like exchanges don't need to make change. Well, like exchanges today don't most many exchanges don't support any stellar assets other than Lumen. So like why why is that relevant in that conversation? Uh, it's relevant because of USDC. It's relevant because oh. there is a group of exchanges <laughs> that support USDC and but a lot don't right. It, it's growing, you know, and it's growing. But like changing. over time, yeah. do, you, do you, I mean, wouldn't you expect, people, like, uh, if there are like any good assets being issued on the smart side, that they would be supported by those uh, exchanges? So it's not like right. they are going to like if on exchange. It's a bit, a bit of a different story, right? They have existing things. They are not issuing tokens, right? They are, it's more like they have a wallet in Classic and you want their, their wallet to continue to work. 
Right. And so, I mean, I think at some point, if they decide that smart assets are interesting and they want to opt in to make the changes, great. But they, they're they probably not going to be the first people to do it. It's probably going to take them a while. And, and it sounds like we just don't want to break them. Yeah, that's fine. But like, I, I don't think we, we, we ever did. None of the proposals so far are saying we would break classic wallets. Um, no, but we are saying, for example, you know, if we're going to recommend issuing on smart going forward then the issuer has like this tough decision where they need to make a decision whether the issue on the old path which maybe is not recommended anymore but is what the exchanges actually know how to support or issuing on the classic side um and you know based on our previous experience it's going to take um you know a whole lot of time for service providers to start enable something new I get that. I'm just kind of uh, a bit skeptical about, like the uh, for exchanges in particular that they won't do. Like basically, I think there are two types of exchanges. There are exchanges that are going to be supporting whatever the latest set of functionalities. I mean, or they are going to kind of keep up. Maybe like you know with some delay, but they are kind of keeping up. And then you have others that are very conservative and going to be slow. Um, and I, mean, I think that's why, for example, I think we don't have still uh, USDC on Coinbase, I think, right? Yeah, still our USDC? Coinbase, according to foreign sources, doesn't have any multi-chain assets right now because of um, extensive technical and product debt. Uh, that, Coinbase is a bit of a special case uh, because they don't even support, they don't support any like USDC, any non-ERC20 USDC. Um, but we do have... Uh, and like it's a it's a pickle. It's difficult because uh, exchanges, uh, you know, there's a bit of a chicken and egg that you know they want to see demand, um, and then it's hard to create that demand without um, you know these assets supporting supported on main exchanges. Um, but I, I think like the main thing I'm trying to to get to here is that like it's hard to get exchanges to to do changes uh, and the service providers as well like folks like BitGo and Fireblocks, right? And right now, these, uh, you know, the way that you issue assets on Stellar, um, you know, the actual distribution is just regular payments, right? So, you know, you can do it on all of these platforms. If you introduce a new way to do it, then you basically tell issuers you can't use these uh, service providers. I mean, that's not really what you're telling them. What you're telling them is, you can't use those service providers if you want to do it the new way. Right. Like so you're not breaking you're the existing functionality. Right. So what you're suggesting is having like this, uh, like a split thing in the ecosystem where you say, hey, you can issue an asset in one of both ways. Um, this way will give you like, you know, like a shorter path to exchanges and you can work with... Uh, um, you know, various service providers. Um, and the other path will give you, will give you what, John? I don't know what it'll give you. It'll give you the power to do whatever you want. The question is, what do you want, right? If they don't want those things, you probably shouldn't do it, right? Like, yeah, like, I, I, like if you think of uh, what we have right now for the network, right, we are kind of optimizing for payments. If the token that you're issuing is not meant to be used for directly supporting payments, then there's no reason to issue it as a classic asset. Like think of like, you know, NFTs or all sorts of you know, random things like that. Well, yeah. I, so I was just saying, like, if you if you if you issue on Classic, then you have the entire breadth of like Classic tooling available at your disposal right now. Like every wallet, every exchange, everything that supports on Classic, um, you have at your disposal. It's uh, so yes, it's about payments, but it's just about like the ecosystem support. I think like payments are also just transfers. So um, it's also not clear to me why why we would even say that NFTs don't care about payments because people do care about transferring NFTs. 
Yeah, but we're not going to have, that is actually kind of broken if you're modeling, like that's kind of what we see today on the network, right? Like the way you model NFTs on the network is extremely poor, the experience that you get. My, I guess one question is like, do do we think that kind of the the value of the smart contract is going to come from people implementing new assets, or do we think the value is going to come from like taking high quality assets that are issued by people who are you know not uh, you know that are that are not particularly uh, you know experimental, and then innovators are going to come and like make new use of those assets. So my Suspicion is that maybe this the, the latter is 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 better, and so that that kind of the, it's more important to interoperate well with existing assets that might be issued by somebody else, and to be able to like program those assets than to be able to create some new ecosystem that's not that's more divorced from the existing one. So I think there are. Uh, it's probably both, David, because you're going to have, yes, you're going to have, you know, the, the stable coins, USDC and such that are going to be used heavily in these smart contracts. But you also are going to have things like governance tokens, uni style uh, tokens and DAO style tokens. Um, and these are going to be issued on the smart side. Uh, you know, we might say, hey, you know what? We don't actually care about about these assets being uh, transferable um as regular payment on the classic side uh, and maybe that helps with um uh with implementation uh but we will see these assets but but i mean i guess i mean put another way like when, when i talk to people who are using stellar right it's 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 often kind of two things that draw them to stellar like sort of the, the perception of like high quality assets and low transaction fees and so if like those are the strengths then we want to kind of make sure that those strengths are uh we we don't want to kind of like sacrifice those strengths and create a completely new ecosystem right we want to be able to kind of maybe for higher transaction fees add more flexibility but where like you can still do things with like low transaction fees and do things with like existing legacy assets right like that that seems to me like the 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 thing that we want to optimize for, of course, it's going to be like whatever Turing complete in general. But but the thing we want to optimize for that's going to make this special is the ability to also leverage these high quality assets and low transaction fees for people who are just doing simple payments. And that's not going to work for everything, but um, but there are probably a lot of cases where like you know people are going to want to use USDC, for example, right? And and maybe we don't want to get Circle to like write some whole new smart contract to implement this. We just want somehow like unilaterally people can write contracts that do things with USDC. Yeah, I think we're getting into a lot of um, speculation and somewhat like religious discussions here. John, can you help us like fine tune, um, like where where do things get hairy in terms of interop and what kind of like uh, you know decisions we can make to simplify that? I mean, there's a couple axes of decisions. Uh, one axis is like wrapping versus not wrapping. Uh, Wrapping generally makes everything easier implementation wise, like significantly so. Um, but like the UX might or might not be better. That's up to your interpretation. Um, if you don't have a wrapping interface, so that's one axis. Um, a second axis of, is like, should a classic asset, when used from the smart perspective, look exactly like a smart asset used from the smart perspective? Should they look identical? Um, should they behave identically? And the third main axis is like, should you be able to take a smart asset and easily send it back to the classic side? Um, that axis is more speculative, I think. But those are kind of like the three angles that one might look at this problem.
one thing that uh, is noticeable in other ecosystems is that there's definitely the the canonical way of doing assets, right? On on the Ethereum ecosystem, even though you can write your own contract, everyone just uh, you know copy pastes the the or imports the the Open Zeppelin one. Um, you know, Solana has like the SPL. Um, other ecosystems have like their baked in contracts uh, for uh, for assets. Like people don't actually innovate all that much with assets. Um, and like, I guess my question to you is like, can we make those like canonical assets on Stellar be the existing assets? Maybe. I mean, I think you'd be making a lot of sacrifices to do so. Are they sacrifices worth make, making? Not to me. Uh, what are the sacrifices? I mean, I think the biggest sacrifice is just like, do we really want to have a 64-bit balance for everything? Um, the next sacrifice is like, do you want it to literally be exactly what exists today? Or do you want to build on top of that more? Because like you would need it like to do the stuff that's common in you know DeFi, you would need an allowance system on top of that anyway. So it's not what we have right now. Um we have all this compliance stuff baked in. It's pretty unwieldy for a variety of reasons. Do we want to be married to that for the rest of eternity? I don't. So I guess what I'm getting at is you can shoehorn anything into anything. Should you? I don't have a really strong opinion about the should you question, but I do have uh, a... I participated briefly the last time around, and I just wanted to add, since you're already doing requirements gathering here, uh, a somewhat narrow version of, of what feel like the requirements I would want to add to this question. I don't actually have very strong opinions about the assets. I do have fairly strong opinions about two minor points. Um, and I think they I think there's a, a wide variety of ways to to achieve these, but if we're writing things down, um, if possible, I would like to request that users not be in charge of nonce management unless they really, really want to. I think if we're in a situation where the user has to figure out how to operate a cryptography API safely and correctly themselves, we're, we're putting them in a very dangerous position. And, and whether we accomplish that by, by completely baking in a standardized path or just having a very easy to delegate standardized path or even just there's a host function that has a very simple signature that's fairly impossible to misuse, I'm, I'm kind of okay with most of those approaches. But um, cryptography APIs become error prone really, really quickly. And I don't want to surface a lot of that to users unless they ask for it, unless they're going out of their way to say, I personally want to do some some fancy cryptography for the average person who's just creating an asset. I really want them to not be forced to copy paste and possibly get wrong the use of a cryptography API. Um, that's requirement slash desire number one. And requirement slash desire number two is um, ideally if that code is going to be in every single contract and it's the only thing that differs from one contract to another. Uh, or, or, or if it's if it's a if it's a standardized preamble in every single contract on every single path, uh, it would be nice just from a code size and execution performance perspective to factor it out as well. So I'm just I know the authorization point is not the only part of interop, but to me it's the only part that I actually care about. I do not care about the other aspects. <laughs> Right. So I think that the, what you just described, I think is that's kind of what is uh, touched on in all this. The, uh, yeah, in, in CAP 52. Um, the authorization model, though, for, for, uh, for payments is, uh, and going back to that, right, is, is, it, is, it, is, different, is different. And that's why there are like things done in a certain way in CAP 52. But I do agree that, you know, as we try to figure out like the actual interrupt story with classic, it, it would be nice if we can uh, avoid having, I mean, having like a, yeah, like good, solid um, 
base implementation that people can just you know pick import in their in their thing and then it just works uh, mostly without having to re-implement those things. And but like the the key part of that, the absolute most important part of that, for from my perspective, is the authorization aspect of it. If you want to, if you want to allow or require people to fiddle other parts, it doesn't matter quite so much. But man, user writing your own authorization code is just a disaster. We have too many crickets. Can somebody make it? I don't know, like, uh... Well, I do have a question. So returning to, to what Tomer sort of started this thread, this thread where he started it, which was most other networks have um, a canonical way, like a canonical representation of, of assets that people just use. His question was, can you know the the current or classic asset just be that canonical representation? John says, you know, he's not a fan of that approach. The question is, is it worth trying to think about like an, are there other models that we could use for the canonical representation of an asset that we could discuss, or is it premature to just to get into that right now? I mean, in a way, you know, you know, like in Cap forty nine, for example, the the wrapped asset is a canonical implementation, you know, of the classic asset, but it's actually something that is modeled as a smart asset. Uh, so, so it's not like people would have to reinvent a bunch of things there. You can actually standardize on exactly that thing. And that's actually what is interesting about the, this, this approach is that you, the way you do it is you actually write a standard, you know, like ERC20 type of equivalent. You design it as, a, as a thinking about the semantics as smart semantics first. And then you, you make it uh, yeah, interrupt with uh, with classic assets, and there's only one way to do it. But yeah, you do have standardization happening in that world. I'm not, so, so going back to that, like uh, I feel like I'm the only one talking. Like it seems to me that the, the standardization is not necessarily the sticky point, because in all those uh, proposals so far, there is actually a standard that includes classic assets. So what else is the is is missing? Right. Got it. Well, are there other questions that people want to bring up now in the last nine minutes that would help sort of move the conversation forward, or should we just call it? I mean, we got through a lot today. I'll let people think for a minute. Okay, I think that's a wrap then. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for joining the discussion. Uh, anyone who's watching, obviously, uh, we're going to post this, you know, to archive it on YouTube later. So if you want to re rewatch this, which I mean, who doesn't, right? I watched these things six or seven times. Um, you can watch them there on YouTube. And also, if you want to participate in the discussion or you want to follow along, please make sure to read the caps. Please join the um, Jump Cannon channels here in the Stellar Dev Discord, and also sign up for the Stellar Dev mailing list where a lot of these discussions will continue asynchronously. And we will see you back here next week for another open protocol meeting. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>